welcome to Reform Exotics. Uh, I am Nick, and with me is Tom. And today we're going to talk about Reform Theology. Uh, the name of this podcast is Reforming Slavics, and so the entire, I guess, podcast started with Reform Theology and how we kind of come across Reform Theology and growing up in the Slavic Pentecostal churches. Um, obviously, we didn't come from that background. Uh, so I wanted to start to just kind of run across the definition of what people think when they hear Reform Theology. If you go to uh, essentially any Russian Slavic church and you say Calvinism, right? Automatically, um, you would have, uh, I guess, red lights pop up in people's minds. For sure. Like those those people believe that you can do whatever you want and once Christ has saved you, you'll be saved for right the perseverance of the saints. Mm-hmm. It's funny because uh, the five points of Calvinism or TULIP were not even the original foundation that uh, you know Calvin wrote about like his institutes the institutes of the Christian religion by John Calvin they didn't include the five points the five points were uh what are they called a, a phrase that was later introduced to uh summarize as points and that was in response to Jacob Arminius and uh his um book in regards to Calvin's theology so uh before we kind of discuss and share our stories of how we run across theology uh, from the Reformation and kind of how it changed our lives. Uh, I want to dive in real quick into the five solas. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, we can run across uh, the five points of Tulip just so people are aware of um, those as well because uh, there are a lot of misconceptions about those. So, um, Tom, the five solas, right? They were initially the cries of the Reformation. Um, again, the five solas were talked about and discussed after the Reformation. They were kind of a summarization of what occurred. But essentially, um, they are Scripture alone, faith alone, grace alone, Christ alone, and to God be the glory alone. So these uh, these solas, they're pretty much... What does solo, solo mean? Uh, so, alone. So, so in the it's Catholic... Latin? Yeah, yeah. So, sola is Latin for alone. And uh, during the Reformation, it was faith with the accompaniment of, uh, you know, indulgences. Faith and grace with the accompaniment of a daily mass where you would go and you mass or sacraments, right? The Catholic Church had additions to the requirements of Scripture, which yeah. Scripture requires, you know, faith alone. And so... Uh, The Reformation was eventually birthed from the fact that uh, Luther realized that man shall live by faith, right? And shall be saved by faith. Yeah, faith alone. And so over time, these were kind of formulated into a systematic theology where Scripture alone means that outside of Scripture, there's no other authority that was given to us by God by which we should live. Um, During the time of the Reformation, obviously you had scripture interpreted by the church and only by the church people weren't even allowed to have scripture in their native language uh, it was yeah it was uncommon to yeah. for a german to read uh, the bible in german right everything was done in latin and not even including you know the fact that the pope was allowed to give dogmas and literally interpret scripture you would not you weren't allowed to interpret scripture for yourself yeah and there was people that tried translating the bible and they literally got burnt at the stake cuz they were uh, you know, they're trying to translate it into English so people couldn't understand Yeah, William it. Tyndale. Yeah. And because of that, he got burnt at a stake because they thought it was like a savage kind of language. Yeah. And on top of that, obviously, the Pope didn't want to lose control and have mm. the common tongue um, yeah. interpret yeah. the Holy Scriptures. Yeah, because one thing we don't understand is that it was a church. The church was by the state. Yeah, it was a sacramental system, meaning the church was the state. The government and the church were not distinguished apart. And so when we say Scripture alone, it literally means that there's no outside revelation or prophecy. There's there's no one who can tell you, well, I received this revelation for God contrary to Scripture. There's no pope who can dictate external traditions that can possibly be yeah. part of your salvation. It was the Bible 
period. God has spoken. Yeah, because one of the arguments uh, that Roman Catholics use today is that they'll say, oh, the even in the early church, right, they talk about how the... This is tra- This is not in the Bible. This is not uh, in Scripture necessarily, but this is passed down as tradition by the mm-hmm. apostles. So, right, they say, "Oh, the apostles taught this to the next, uh, the next uh, generation. Christian. Yeah, the next generation, the next Christians, and this was supposed to be passed down. Like God preserved it through through this way." And yeah. What would you say to that? Well, we say that um, God had spoken in His Word. Yeah. And. Uh, Peter even states that we were given all things for life and godliness and the canon was closed at, at the end of Revelation when, when John finished his book. And so um, we can actually go through church history and debunk these myths that are prescribed by you know the Roman Catholics that say, hey, we have this tradition that's passed down through ages and ages and ages. Mm. And when they give you proof texts from history, uh, they're misconceptions. And a lot of times they're ignorant or their misquotes, and you can go through the church fathers. You can go through, um, like the very early, you know, very early fathers in yeah. history, and you can say, well, this is what they believed. And over time, you can go in history and look at the progression of Christian faith. And the one thing everyone adheres to in the early church is that Scripture was the living, living, breathing Word of God that allowed us to live properly. Yeah, but one thing that I'd like to say is that sola scriptura does not mean uh, you sitting by yourself under a tree with a Bible without any other influence from your past generations. Yeah, yeah. well, e- even Scripture talks about the fact that we're supposed to be part of the body and we're supposed to have elders and teachers and pastors that influence us when we discuss Scripture, right? So those are kind of in Scripture, but the primary thing was that Scripture alone was the authority by which the church and as individuals and as a congregation lived and the next thing would be uh, faith alone, that um, only by faith in Christ do we attain salvation and forgiveness of sins. Like, there's nothing you can add to the fact that you are saved. You could only trust in the work that Christ has already provided. Yeah, and we would believe that faith is a gift from God. Which is which is by grace alone. The very next thing is uh, yeah. that... It is the grace of God that he provides the faith. And that's Ephesians chapter 2, where he talks about, you know, that we are saved by faith through grace. And so it is the grace of God, it is the gift of God, that we are given saving faith and repentance to see his beauty, to see his glory. Yeah. Uh, And the next solo would be Christ alone. uh, That there is no other name under heaven that was given for us to be saved. Mm-hmm. And uh, he is the only one we adore. He is the only one we worship. And it was also a uh, refutation of the fact that the Pope was the vicar of Christ or the very representation of Christ here on earth. Because uh, the Pope's through generations, they they erred, they messed up, they were really immoral men. And essentially throughout a majority of church history, the office of Pope... Uh, the Roman bishop was bought. It wasn't, you know, attained through uh, spiritual maturity or through the guidance of the Holy Spirit. It was literally bought with a price by men who had the ability to purchase it with, with wealthy families. It was a very political position. And yeah. so the Reformation uh, rejected that. And they said, "Not po- the Pope is not uh, the authority of the, the church. The vicar of Christ. Yeah, he's not a, a t- above the church. Christ is the head, according to Scripture, right? Christ is the head of the church, and we are the body. Yeah, and as you go further into, like, for example, like Roman Catholic teaching, that's just an example we have, but there's many other uh, uh, you know, parts of, you know, like, f- false cults, you know, I wouldn't call Roman Catholic you know, as cults, but I would say that a lot of you just, if you understand these points, then it'll it'll help you, uh, you know, test, you know, all all your other doctrines. Yeah, essentially, um, if you can kind of pinpoint your faith on these principles, 
you yeah. can you can it's a roadmap to test what is truly from scripture and what is christianity as as you know prescribed by scripture and that came from the words and the living breathing mouth of god rather than some tradition that was made by men through generations like the uh, sacramental system of rome or like the uh, worship of um what would they say they're not statues but like the icons right and relics the, relics um in the eastern church and lastly uh sola dea gloria is to god be the glory alone all things that were created all things that we do all things on this earth living breathing or animate are purposed for one reason that is to glorify god right all things lead to the glory of god uh, creation pronounces the glory of god we as christians live to the glory of god um, right there's that catechism the chief reason of man is to enjoy god and glorify him forever yeah um, and those were the, kind of the five points that the reformation is often summarized as uh, but then you also have the five points of calvinism which is tulip which which were not from the reformation but like it was it was came up from a controversy a few years later yeah so i can explain this real quick the Reformation started in the 1500s, early 1500s, right? 1517 was kind of the date that Martin Luther nailed the 95 Thesis on the Wall. But even Martin Luther didn't know he was starting the Reformation at that point. He was yeah. just a, a Roman Catholic priest who was kind of angry and confused about a couple of things. He wanted a debate and a discussion within yeah. the church. And we're talking about the Protestant Reformation. Yeah, and then after Luther comes Calvin. Calvin is a second-generation reformer. He is known for Calvin's Institutes, and he is known for pastoring a church in Geneva. And during that time of his, um, essentially his life, he wrote the Christian Institutes, which was a book that was dedicated to the king of France in order to uh, uh, quiet the persecution of Protestants and uh, in, in France because... A lot of them were being murdered and essentially being you know, burned at the stake and persecuted. And so this book contains essentially all the systematic theologies that Calvin believed. And in that book were principles of TULIP, but the very definition or the very acronym TULIP was developed after there was a controversy with, um, Jake, was it Jacob Arminius, I want to say? Arminius who wrote on the freedom of man and said that these points were mm -hmm. inconsistent with scripture. And then Calvin, in response to that, you know, people from Calvin's camp created this phrase, yeah. essentially, right? But not Calvin. He was already gone. Yeah, Calvin did not create TULIP. Um, so the first, the, the T in TULIP is total depravity. And essentially, it's as uh, as a result of Adam's fall, the entire human race is affected. All humanity is dead in transgressions and sins. Man is unable to save himself. Um, and essentially, what that means is that because of Adam's sin and fall, everyone after Adam, we are his seed, and he was the federal head that essentially damned us all to hell. Like, we are born in sin, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we are... Uh, David, I believe, says, and sin did my mother conceive me. Yeah. Romans 5, you know, talks about how through one man's death, well, through one man's trespass or sin, death entered into the world. And then in contrast to Christ, through one man's death. Yeah. Adam's, Adam's, Adam's sin brought in death. Yeah. And then Christ's death brought redemption to all men. And Christ is the second Adam. And the, the, then the you or the unconditional election part of TULIP is essentially that because man is dead in sin, uh, he's unable to respond to God. And so um, before the foundation of the earth, Christ was slain, right? Uh, this historical progression, all the things that occur in history from the fall of Adam to modern day, is not a surprise to God. It's not a plan B to God. God purposed and ordained these things to pass. And in fact, before the creation of the earth, the Lamb of God is already slain. Yeah. Right? So 
Christ redeems and elects his people, he chooses his people, even bef- before the world was created, Christ already knew who he would die for. Yeah. In uh, Ephesians 1, chapter 1, verse 4 through 6, it says, Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be blameless or holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, in which he has blessed us in the beloved. Yeah, I mean, God predestined his elect for his glorious grace. Yeah. And this was... You know, sometimes people think that maybe the the tulip in the five points of Calvinism that it was like a that it was made first, but no, it was in response to Jacob Arminius saying that it was conditional election, that it was up to us. Yeah, if we chose God, then He would redeem us. Yeah, and so it goes back to like who chooses who first, right? And the like everybody, every Christian should believe in predestination because it's in the bible yeah but the point is what is what is your definition of predestination is that god looks into the future and then decides who he decides who will choose who will choose him and then he chooses them or is it god looks into the future and all he sees are a bunch of men who are fallen in adam and they well does god the question is does god even look into the future right (laughs) if god has to look into the future that means does he does he control the present Mm. and so you know as you were saying some people claim that god looks into the future and sees who would choose him and then he chooses them yeah but but wouldn't that make god gaining knowledge yeah and essentially god is reacting to human choices yeah and so god is not all-knowing and so we would we would stand with scripture and say God himself is free to predestine and save a people for his own purposes and glory. Yeah. Right? Well, but but you see, but in the Bible you see God uh like here's a counter question to that like but don't you see God in the Bible reacting to humans? Um you know if like you to prayer. Yeah, so you would say that God answers prayers, right? And prayer is an interesting one because we see in Exodus, I think chapter 32, where God says, Moses goes up the mountain. God says, I will destroy Israel. I will wipe them out. And then in response to that, Abraham, I'm not Abraham, uh, Moses says, but you promised. Yeah. You promised in your covenant to Abraham that these are your people and that they will inherit the land that you were that you were sojourning in Abraham, right? Your your descendants will be as the sea, uh, as, as the sand and the sea and the stars in the heavens. And also, Judah is the one lineage from whom Christ comes. So at that moment, Moses is praying to God and God changes his mind, right? And then he says, okay, I won't go with you, but an angel will go with you. Mm-hmm. And Moses says, but you, again, you promised. And so if we say in that moment that God changed his mind there, then we have to say that God is mutable, meaning he can change. And that contradicts scripture where yeah. it says God does not change. God is not mutable. He, you know? Yeah. And so what I think uh, scripture reveals to us is that God uses the mechanism of prayer to accomplish his purposes. Yeah. He uses anthropomorphism, which means using human emotion and human thought processes to explain himself to us because he's so other and holy from us yeah. by interacting with Moses in a way where he says, Moses, pray and I will respond, right? And so we have to realize that God is immutable, he's unchangeable, but he uses prayer as a mechanism in order to... Yeah affect things in in this world because there's a lot of language in the old testament talking about like god regretted repented that he he wiped uh, right well yeah and that yeah it says that he repented and the different time it says that he regretted that he made man yeah it's like wait how could god regret you know what he did if he knew you know what was going to happen but yeah it's like you said it's it's language that uh, the old testament uses to help us understand 
or some in some way to understand uh, God. Yeah, bec- the the word I use is anthropomorphic, meaning human oriented, and because God is not human, He's so other and so holy or so separate from us. Yeah. In order to express His emotions that we have and that he doesn't possess, right? He doesn't possess qualities of immutability. We change all the time. God doesn't change. And so he has to use language that we would understand um, to affect his expressions toward us. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and I guess we can go maybe later more specific because this is such a rough thing. Yeah, we're, there's, there's so many objections to each one of these points that, you know, even I had um, so many things to go over. And because this is a deep topic, like this is a lot, a lot of scripture you have to go through and see, like, is this consistent throughout the Bible? But the reason I'm convinced, the reason you're convinced of this is because not because uh, not because this cool guy with the long beard, John Calvin, you know, is so appealing to us. No, because we believe it's completely in scripture. Yeah, this would go back to the first um, solo, which is. So scriptura or scripture alone. Scripture alone governs our hearts and the way we live as Christians and all the things we know about God in the Christian life come from scripture. And all these writers and books uh, essentially are just commentary and systematiz- systematizations of the scriptures. Um, and, and going on, like the L is the worst, uh, I would say the worst offense to anyone who's not reformed or calvinistic which is limited atonement well i think it's only most offensive for you know just common christianity in in america well we're going to talk later about how we came to know reformed theology and how we were introduced to it and i'll tell you right away a limited atonement was the biggest hurdle for me i i literally warred against it in my heart and my mind and read through scripture warring against this understanding of who God is for about two years for me, for some reason, once I understood it was for me, it was more unconditional election. Mm. And some reason when I got over that, every limited tone was like, well, it doesn't seem like such a big deal to me. I don't know why. Uh, So limited atonement is uh, because God determined that certain people should be saved unconditional election, right? It just flows for the, from the next point. Uh, since God determined that certain people should be saved um, as a result of God's unconditional election, he determined that Christ should die for the elect alone. Yeah. All whom God has elected and whom that's whom Christ will die for. Right. And like one of the biggest passages about that is um, I would say the actual death of Christ where he says it is finished. There was a work that Christ yeah. actually accomplished on the cross. Like, like, what is finished? Yeah, what exactly did Christ atone? What did he finish? And then two, uh, John six, John chapter 6, um, you know, verses 32, where he says, All those whom the Father draws to me, I shall lose none of them, but I shall raise them up in the last day. And I found that those two scriptures are, are an impossible barrier to those who have an issue with limited atonement. Right? The, the problem with limited atonement is, uh, and and also John ten eleven where it says I I am the good shepherd the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And then, um, John seventeen nine, you know says I am praying for them I am not praying for the world but for those whom you have given me for they are yours. Yeah, and so it is it is the Father who gives to the Son, the Son dies for them and then the Holy Spirit regenerates them. Mm-hmm. Right, and we can. Some people say it. it's not fair. Like that was the biggest thing for me. How is it fair that God only dies for some and not for others? Right. Yeah, or chooses some and the rest He lets them, lets them do their own free choices. Yeah, which in Adam all all sin and the, what is the result result of sin? They the wages of sin is death. Uh, yeah. Romans six, right? But the reason people have such an uncomfortable understanding of that is because we have a very twisted view of God and holiness and righteousness, right? Mm -hmm. We say, how unfair, how dare God, or how unfair is God to save or die for only some and not others? And the reform response would be, how unfair that God would die for anyone. Mm 
we all deserved wrath and hell. And God would be absolutely loving, absolutely holy, and absolutely righteous to not send his only begotten holy son to die for even one person. Yeah. And so the, the thing that we deserve is wrath and punishment and hell because we have earned it. Literally, it says the wages, the earnings of sin is death. And we earned hell. And so we would say that it's unfair that Christ died for anyone. Yeah, if you're in a court of law and, uh, you know, the judge relents and has mercy on you, it's not something that he has to do. Yeah, and, and in fact, it would be unjust for a holy judge or a righteous judge not to punish sin, right? Yeah. And so we would say that in the gospel, when Christ dies on the cross, he takes every single sin of every single person who would believe in him. And he takes it on the cross and it says that the wrath of God is poured out on the son, right? It says in Isaiah that the father or, or the God crushed him. Yeah, he laid the iniquity of us all on, on him. Yeah, and so if Christ died for everyone in the world, let's say, let's take that, that position that Christ died for all, every single person in the world, all of their sin were laid upon Christ, and he was crucified for all, them. All their sin is paid for. Yeah, the wrath of God has been satisfied for all sin for all the world. That means there's no wrath left. That means no one should go to hell, and yet people end up in hell. Yeah. And so that's, that's why if you're consistent, you have to say that people only go to hell for their unbelief. Yeah. And then you would have to say, well, so people aren't, there's not, there's not different levels of punishment. Oh, and, but there is. Yeah. There's many, many scriptures that, you know, that prove that. Yeah. And again, this is a deep topic that you can dive in and kind of talk about, but essentially we would, ar we would argue from scripture that Christ died for those who would believe in him only and those who believe in him only believe in him because the father had given him faith to trust in him according to john chapter 6 yeah. and ephesians chapter 2 isn't it usually limited atonement because it sounds kind of weird like it, it sounds offensive limited yeah. atonement sounds offensive, like yeah. like that you're limiting god to something yeah we but would the, say particular atonement or specific atonement yeah definite atonement yeah but the thing is, if you look at both both sides of the argument, Ar Ar Arminians would say they're also limiting God, but they're limiting God in a different aspect. They're limiting God's freedom to save for his own eternal purposes. Yeah, Meaning, they're limiting his power. Yeah, they're saying that human will or human power, human the human choice is greater than God's sovereignty and his grace. Meaning that if I don't choose to believe and trust in God, yeah. God has no power none at all to change my heart and so it is up to me to choose god and then repent and only then after i repent and chose god he saves me right yeah even if it's 99 percent god and then that one percent it's all up it's just up to you yeah and then it goes back to the idea of solo dea gloria meaning to god be the glory alone yeah only God, 100% of glory goes to God. And a great illustration that I've heard before, and I know you heard too, is that a lot of people say that salvation or the picture of the Christian saving faith is that you are drowning and you're floating in a sea that's uh, stormy and the waves are enormous and, some, and Christ throws you a life preserver and you grab onto it and that's the picture of Christian salvation. And the Reformed, and I believe biblical view, would say that no, you were dead at the bottom of the sea. You, you, were, you were a corpse. You were a rotting corpse at the bottom of the sea. Christ dove to the bottom of the sea, and yeah. he resurrected you into new life, and he brought you up. And uh, passages in Ezekiel talking about the heart of stone given to the man and given a heart of flesh. God exchanges our hearts. The, the bones being raised to life um, in his vision as well describe that Christ, in fact, does save us from sin. Paul says, you were dead in your sins and trespasses. Yeah. Because, you know, Romans 8, 7, for example, says, for the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It's mm -hmm. at enmity. It's at war against God. For it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But then it says, you, however, not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if in fact the spirit of God dwells in you. So it's like, wait a second. 
if you have the Spirit of God, then something has changed. You can please God now. But wait, if you're in that contrast, you're in the in from the flesh. You can't please God. And what is something pleasing to God? To repent, to yeah. believe. To. You know, Hebrews says it is impossible to believe God because he who please you must believe that he is, and he yeah. rewards those who seek him. And so I think it's consistent the scripture that once you're born again, you have the Spirit of God. You're going to do what's pleasing to God, and that's to repent, that's to believe. Yeah, a, a very controversial phrase that I heard before, too, is that once you're saved, you can do whatever you want. Because what? all you want to do, <laughs> from your nature change, all the things you want to do is to glorify God, right? You, you do fall, you do commit sins, you do slide into sin. But your nature, your, your desires yeah. have been changed with the new heart, the new heart gives you the desire to please him. And so all the things you want to do is to glorify him and live sin free and um, have the power to you know, preach the gospel and, and proclaim his kingdom. Yeah. And so lastly is... Uh, no, second last. Oh, second last? Irresistible grace. It is that if God did elect you and he does redeem you, uh, God makes... I guess that's kind of man, what we willing to come to him. Yeah, we just kind of ran over that in our discussion. Yeah, that pretty much... Once the like spirit of God, you know, starts working on you, pretty much God can pretty much finish what He started. Yeah, He changes your heart, and so you see His beauty. And once you see His beauty, you delight in it. Your heart desires Him. I think that passage in Ezekiel, you know, we're talking about that He takes His heart of stone, and gives you a heart of flesh. Yeah, and then it says what, that He will cause you to do, and I will write my law upon their hearts right yeah and he'll cause us to walk in his ways yeah he'll cause us it's something that it's active it's something that's the power of the holy spirit the holy spirit constantly works in our hearts to walk after god's heart and obey his word and to trust and with faith constantly in prayer honor him and live our lives according to that the last one is the perseverance of the saints Right, mm-hmm. and essentially that says that whatever God has started, those whom He elected, He will preserve through life and keep, and He will raise upon in the last day into glory. Or if they are still present on earth, He will take Him up with Him. And I believe John six, right? Um, Jesus says, "All that the Father has given me, I shall lose none, but I will raise up in the last day." Yeah, um, and I think that's a. There's a, there's a ton, a ton of passages that, you know, we're going to talk about, you know, we're going to talk about how I was convinced. I think even how, even before, like, even though I was resisting, you know, a lot of this, a lot of these points, mm-hmm. I had, I, I was, I, the first one I was really convinced, uh, I, I was convinced of was perseverance of the saints. Like God is preserving your salvation, not you, you with your works. Yeah, because then it's like, if God can, if you could lose your salvation, then it's like, what do you got to do to keep it? (laughs) And if you can lose your salvation, did God fail somehow in preserving you? Like, if Christ died on the cross for your sins, and he redeemed all of them, and he died for all your sins on the cross, right? Past, future, present. How then can you obtain wrath if Christ already accomplished the work? In other words... Now we're deciding that we're going to work for our salvation. Yeah. Like, are we attributing anything to our salvation other than our sin? Yeah. And I, from Scripture, we see that the only thing that we bring to the table is our sin. And yeah. the only one who brings righteousness to the table is Christ. Uh, and that's kind of, a, I think, a good summary, like a rough, uh, I would say a rough draft of what Reformed theology centers around. Now there are different branches of Reformed theology. If you look like to historical Reformed theology, it was very sacral, meaning the church and state were one. You baptized your kids, you, your babies. You um, you did a lot of things in the Reformation. But the motto of the Reformation is continue, continually reforming. Semper Reformata, meaning always reforming, right? Yeah. And the goal is to... Because there's things that we believe that even the Reformers had it wrong like for example we don't baptize babies now some 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 reformed people do the presbyterians do but the argument would be that there were people in the day of the reformers that refused to baptize their kids and they were called the anabaptist and they were 
drowned. They, they received a third baptism for that, right? They called it third baptism when they were drowned because they did not want to baptize their kids. And it had to do with the fact that the taxes ran through the fact that the, the, the figure, the counting of taxes and how much taxes you paid for the kids was done through baptism. Like mm. how many kids you got baptized, that's how many taxes you paid for, you know, the amount of people and we don't really understand that because it was a lot more integrated with like the church and this and the government yeah but i would say from a, like a slavic perspective like from a going from a christian russian perspective that we grew up in these would be the points that would be the eye of the storm where the discussion is occurring right these are the focus points yeah i think one thing that a lot of times uh listen to preachers or teachers of reformed theology or calvinism they'll say that there needs to be an s like at the end of tulip Mm -hmm. like tulips Mm -hmm. because the sovereignty of god is something that really revolve like is something that is the center of a lot of what we believe and because we believe it's completely biblical that god you know it says god is in the heavens he does whatever he pleases yeah god does what he wills and none can stay his hand and so we truly believe that God is the author and finisher of our faith. We believe that he is the one who redeemed us. We believe that he holds the world in the power of his hand. He believe that he, sorry, he sustains the world by the power of his word. And we believe that he will eventually unravel this world in fire and judgment. And he will create and restore a new one for us to worship him in glory forever. And he is actively working constantly in this world and there's not a single molecule of the universe not a single atom that is out of the control of his divine decrees meaning that whatever god speaks whatever he wants every single little molecule obeys his commands and that's i be- that i believe is the center of reformed theology and the essence of what we believe that scripture has to say about god mm-hmm. um now we kind of discussed all the points of Reformed Theology. I didn't even know about the solas uh, until years after my journey into kind of like diving into Calvinism and the research I did um, with church history. But when you were saved, um, what were what was like the first thing that caught your mind in regards to Reformed Theology after, uh, after you, you know? Um, well, the thing is... When I went to Bible school, for example, at SMBS, Slavic Missionary Bible School, the first time I was kind of, like, I heard of it before, like, predestination, but very, very roughly, like, super roughly. And I think it was probably because of you guys, the... Our family. <laughs> your, your your family, something, talking about something about predestination. Mm-hmm. But very, very, like, very, very surface level. But I remember hearing that analogy in SMBS. One of our teachers talked about how you're a man, like the views of Calvinism and Arminianism is like, you know, you're a man at the bottom of a pit and like, you know, God puts the ladder and then he, it's, it's your choice to use that ladder, whether you want it or not. And that's essentially, do you want to be saved or not, right? Yeah. And then his view of Calvinism was, oh, God just leaves you in the pit and you have no choice and you have no ability or you know something like that Mm -hmm. but it was complete misrepresentation like you said because you know the man at the bottom of the pit he's actually dead he doesn't have a choice yeah so my only introductions were kind of i think misrepresentations and that's not that's nothing to fault with the the church or the school that i went to i think that uh, there's a lot of misrepresentation on both sides, right? Yeah, yeah. There's definitely a need for more discussion about these things, for sure, and informed discussion. People who know these things because this can... could be this is like such a heated debate that we need to put our emotions aside and sure we could we could be passionate about this, but we have to love one another because this is a secondary issue. This yeah. is not something that's gonna separate the goats the goats and the sheep this is something that yes is very important i think that every single christian should think about because there's certain people that think oh this is not important Mm -hmm. that it doesn't really uh 
like matter what you believe about this issue it's just wasting time it's just causing division but no it's so important because there's ramifications to what you view god yeah yeah i remember when you came back from smbs we started bible studies at your parents house yeah and uh we went through romans we were we were going through romans and I remember uh, discussing Romans 9 with you and I, I believe Zach and a couple other guys were there. And uh, it was interesting to like discuss it because I don't believe you still, you were kind of, you're kind of in the middle of like, you know, what is Reformed theology? And I remember like describing Romans 9 and, and the explanation of God's power to choose and God hardening Pharaoh's heart. And then the description of the you know, pots, want some some clay pots yeah. they choose for destruction, some for uh, honorable uses. Yeah, and I think my biggest mind blow, my uh, mind blowing thing was when I asked, like, how is that fair? Like, how is God, uh, how is it that God, you know, how, how could God do this? How can he just not extend his hand to every single person mm-hmm. and, you know, just, give out his grace equally and you said that like if you wanted fair if you wanted justice we would all be would be all in hell yeah like if if god were to be just and a fair righteous judge he would send all of us to hell yeah because we deserve it and a lot of times we ignore that because um we ourselves believe that there's something inherently righteous in us and we can somehow show God the works we have done and present to him and say, God, look, I've accomplished this much. And I love Ray Comfort's example of the, the justice system and the judge. And he says, if you come up to a judge and say, judge, I know I've committed murder, but just yesterday I helped a lady cross the street. I did something good. Yeah. The judge would say, well, you still have to be punished for the crime you committed. And, you know, scripture says our good works our good deeds according and in front of god are as filthy rags um and, and that just kind of transforms your perspective of the holiness and the righteousness of god and the justice of god and his true love for saving a people that didn't deserve it um and when was the like we kind of talked about how you ran across well, Reformed yeah theology. it was it was actually even before uh you know i started to listen to this like random preachers on youtube Mm -hmm. and i would listen to a huge wide variety and one person that uh, really struck a chord with me that like whoa this is this is awesome like i never heard preaching like this before was john piper and Mm -hmm. he was going through the book of job and he was showing god's sovereignty and how even the devil was god's servant yeah that right it's not like god ever lost control of like the devil all of a sudden like going a rampage and killing like striking job and his his family and stuff it was more that <laughs> god was literally putting limitations even on the devil like only go this far do not take his life yeah you he, can't you can't do this and it goes up okay you can touch his body but you can't take his life and uh, yeah the phrase that even the devil's god's devil um it's 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 the it's the changing factor, I believe, in my life, realizing that all the suffering and pain and heartache and just the wrenching suffering that we all experience or will experience in this life is absolutely purposeful, ordained by God, and God is in charge of every second of it. And he uses all those things, not only for his purposes, for, for ultimate good. And I remember discussing Romans eight twenty eight with someone and it, you know, Romans eight twenty, all things work together for those who love God are called to His purpose, mm-hmm. called according to His purpose. And I remember that 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 specific um, verse just kind of finally clicking that all things in my life are for my good and for His glory, and God is the worker and shaper and planner of all those things. Yeah, God's way more wise than we are, and if we're to put away suffer, suffering or put away hardship in our life and not think that oh is that it was god mm-hmm. then like then what is god then what is god doing is he reacting to our suffering or something like that no it says that 
the worst suffering that ever happened, the most innocent person that ever suffered was God, and it said that it was appointed. He was appointed to die. Yeah, like the worst crime that has been ever committed against anyone was the fact that the most holy Christ was put to death unjustly and was punished worse than any sinner had ever been because he received the punishment and the wrath of God on the cross Mm -hmm. on the behalf of all sinners. And he took upon himself like individual, individual, right? We believe that Christ on the cross knew every single, God the Father was punishing for every single person he's ever going to save and elected. And every single sin that he ever, we ever committed was in fact paid for on the cross by Christ. And so to know that truth is really um, like awe, like you're in awe of God's grace. You're in awe of God's mercy. Yeah. And if my point was just that, if that's an example of God, uh, you know, ordaining suffering, putting into plan that, hey, this is this is how this is how his son is gonna suffer, mm-hmm. and so he knows when we're gonna suffer, and he ordains it. He he doesn't he does all these things for our good, and a lot of times it's not it's not like the American uh, lifestyle that we kind of want, right? We want you know, well, we want peace. We want a good, happy life, successful life. But what does God want for our lives? He wants us to become more like Christ. Yeah. And, and that's that's yeah. ultimately his plan for us. Yeah. And it's going to involve suffering and it's going to involve things that we don't understand and we we might like I think this theology helps us understand that there is purpose like you said. Purpose and suffering, purpose and heartache, purpose yeah. and evil because ultimately we might not see it as good as suffering as good. But if it makes us become more like Christ, yeah, and then it, it's going to give us more joy at the end of the day. Yeah, at the end of the day, this this light momentary affliction is working yeah. in us in eternal weight of glory. Yeah, Christ redeems every single moment of suffering. He redeems and purchases every single heartache and uh, difficulty and sickness and despair. He takes all that, and in glory in heaven, we see that all those things worked in fact for us an eternal weight of glory and that really uh, assures my heart and allows me to trust in christ in most difficult circumstances in my life right the most heart circumstances in my life Definitely. i can point to the sovereignty of god and his goodness because of the cross and say that's for my good the very act that i'm going through might not be good yeah. but it is for my good yeah I think one way that it does impact my life in another way is I think it gives gives me a like because this was so hard for me to like it, it's really humbling. It's not something that I wanted to accept. I kept on resisting it mm-hmm. and I kept on resisting the you know theology, reformed theology because I knew had certain like like my heart didn't want to accept how sovereign God is over my life. And I, I also, it humbled me and understood that God didn't have to have mercy on me. God didn't have to die for me. He didn't have to do these things for me. But for whatever reason, he, you know, for his glory, he, he decided to, to have mercy on me. Yeah. I remember for myself, uh, there were two pivotal moments of uh, truly understanding who God is and allowing my life to represent and glorify him one was the fact that when i became a christian uh, i had a really confusing understanding of how my salvation is preserved and i remember having a conversation with my cousin i was like i was saved right if i sin and don't repent is that just like in the air (laughs) like if i sin and don't repent, and tomorrow I die. What happens to me, right? Yeah, or like, like where's it, my assurance? Or if there's a spectrum, like, you no, know, a lot of Christians say, oh, it would have to be ongoing sin over like habitual and over. sin. Yeah, but at what point have you gone too far? Like, at what point can you, you know, lose your salvation? Yeah, and so like, for, for me, that was the 
ultimate question. And then the, the you know, the coin dropped or like the, the understanding came that was like, it is the purchase of Christ for all sin on the cross that made your salvation just and justified. Mm-hmm. And so now, no matter your sin, Christ already, it is already accomplished. It is finished, Christ said on the cross. And so now live as though you were redeemed. And so your sin does not hold you back from redemption because Christ already redeemed that. That doesn't give you a license to sin because the very evidence of your salvation is the fact that you desire and you have the power through the Holy Spirit to live a righteous life, right? We would say as Reformed people that if you are living like an unsaved person and you are living in sin and you have no remorse and you don't care and you claim to be saved, we would say that you are not saved and you should check where your assurance yeah. lies because you should be scared. Yeah. You should be frightened because a Christian hates sin and loves Christ and has the Holy spirit and the Holy spirit gives you actual power and authority to not be a slave to sin, but to be a slave to Christ. And that was like one of the biggest transformational moments in my life. I was like, Hey, my sin does not negate my salvation, but it constantly makes me look into my heart and repent and trust in Christ even more and even more. And the other one I mentioned was uh, limited atonement. That how is it, how is God, you know, so unfair that He would die only for some and others? And like we talked about, it makes more sense when you look at it from the perspective of how could God die for anyone? Us, a rebellious, wretched people um, that don't deserve anything, and yet we have such a great. Uh, redemption and now we are not no longer slaves but you know christ and heirs and co-heirs of christ and christ has given us a father and he had called us his own right we are little children of god and that understanding also really revolutionized my understanding that hey we are so god is so so gracious to us that he died for our sins and those two things really kind of impacted my life significantly from from theology yeah. Well, yeah, if 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 God, you know, if God uh people object to that like limited atonement stuff and how we 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 felt how we're fallen in Adam mm-hmm. and say it's not fair like how can we how could we not choose Christ until he you know chooses us and like of course, we don't see that like in the picture of, you know, behind the scenes, like how God's been working in us. Yeah. So, like I, I didn't notice in my age, in my young, young age, God had been working through me through a long, long time. And then it was a continual process until I was probably, you know, like 20 mm-hmm. until I was like actually saved. A lot of people object that like, how can every single person be represented in the fall of Adam? Like, how could Adam represent us like that? But then they don't see, like, how is it fair that we can be represented in Christ? Yeah, yeah. If, if one is true, the other one is true as well, right? Yeah, because God, how could God, how could the Son, Jesus, give us his righteousness? How could he give us a perfect righteousness that he lived out? Because mm-hmm. he didn't just die for us. He also lived for us. He also lived for us. Yeah. He took all of our sin. He took all of the wrath of God unto himself but he also gave us something and then yeah he gave us a perfect slate he gave us not uh, a clean slate i mean but a perfect lived out life a perfect lived out obedient life which he lived uh, on the earth which is why he had to be a man yeah and so we can see that in the gospel story um yeah these these are kind of the entrances to reform theology that you know go so much deeper in not only like theological headspace, but also in daily lived out applications of uh, trusting in God and, and, and assurance in Him and knowing that He's sovereign and is in control of your life, knowing that the sickness, the pain, the heartache that come in your life are all purposed and are pointed toward your good and His glory. I think that's kind of the, the thought we should leave off with that Ultimately, Reformed theology is about a good God redeeming a people for his own purposes. And we can experience the grace that he had provided.